What is up guys? Coach Joe here at the Lion's Den located in Colmar, PA. I have something pretty special that you're going to watch, but I just want to give you some background context to it. Over the last several years of doing this, I've been able to work with coaches and athletes all over the world. It's pretty amazing. One of my athletes is named Luke and he's based in the UK. Luke and I have been training together for about a year and since then he's made tremendous progress when it comes to his personal goals with coaching. He's also a coach himself and runs an internship program. I've been fortunate enough to be able to come onto his internship program and speak to his students about RPE based training. So if you guys are interested in RPE based training, the background of it, how it's used, why I use it and how you can use it, I think you're going to find this video super useful. So it is a little bit different than my typical videos you'll see posted on YouTube, but this is going to be more on the educational side of things. So check out the video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, check out all of Luke's resources, which I'll tag down below, and hopefully you can include RPE-based training into your training system that you're using right now. Thanks a lot, Luke, for working with me and trusting me, and also bringing me on board to talk to your interns for this program. I've got the I've got Eric Helms' research up here around RPE and the application for reps. And was it, what is this stuff about, Joey? So RP is basically going to be a load management system uh, that we like to use in the strength and conditioning world. Uh, so real quick, guys, I've been working with Luke for over a year at this point. Uh, we've had some awesome success with his training. Uh, he does custom programming, which just means we have an end goal uh, from about, you know, say our general goal has been I want to say six months to a year worth of planning. Uh, so for me, when I look at the programming and the training, we want to be as methodical about it as possible. And just like he was saying, uh, if you're trying to get really strong, unfortunately, you're going to walk into the realm of aches and pains. It's kind of inevitable. Uh, but what we can do is mitigate that as much as possible through proper programming and structure programming and using uh, principles such as auto regulation. So uh, has anybody here heard of RPE-based training? Some of you guys, show of hands, yes, no. Okay, cool. Do, do any guys experiment with that or use it? Sort of on and off, okay. So the, the two basic ones that stick out to me is gonna be percentage-based training and RPE-based training. So. RPE is basically using a scale of one to 10. Uh, it used to actually be part of the Borg scale. The Borg scale, uh, I, I believe, went from uh, six to 20 or, or one to 20, but six to 20 is what we counted. And then we kind of thought, well, that's a really big range of how to gauge intensity in that six to 20 uh, rep range, or it's actually used for, for heart rate variability as well. Um, so the modern day scale came out and that was one through 10. So that, that had simplified a lot of things and made it very easy to understand. So for example, um, since it's one out of 10, so 10 being uh, a true max effort. So if I said do one rep at an RP 10, that means that you could do no more. It would be your one rep max. It'd be the heaviest weight that you could load. Now that's pretty easy to understand. Um, but if I said, let's do, uh, for example, uh, we have on the screen, right, log, clean, and press in the second column, four reps at RP6. RPE6 out of 10 means that after that fourth rep, we hypothetically could do about four reps more, okay? And as a coach, typically in RPE training, I don't count anything that's below a six. I just call that a warm-up. Uh, because it's going to be really hard to gauge basically, uh, you know, where that lies on the scale. So after we get to about a six, that's going to be our working sets. Uh, so this is just a great tactic and tool to use uh, for training. And it's something that I, so I didn't actually start using this until the last probably four or five years. And I found it through guy named Mike Tushier. So he runs RTS. And that's just a name you guys may want to write down and check out. Uh, also, Eric Helms, okay, another big one. Uh, he's one of my friends and colleagues. So I've had some good discussions with him on that. And there are pros and cons to each of these things, uh, whether when it comes to percent-based training and RPE-based training. So I'll, I'll kind of dive into that if that's kind of the direction you guys want to take with it. Um, but Really, I just find it to be the best system to use 
uh, for long-term uh, fatigue management uh, and stress management and getting the most uh, results possible with mitigating, uh, let's just say, aches and pains as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of the background on that. Uh, you'll find most high-level lifters use some sort of auto-regulation or they use some sort of RPE-based training. And we'll get into the nitty-gritty. I actually use both. So if you actually were to look, if you want to pull that up, Luke, again, you can see how we use RPE-based training as well as percentage-based training. So uh, if you look at, let's just say, the log clean and press or the deadlift, Okay, I have Luke working up to uh, a four, four reps at RP8 and then taking off 10% of that. And the reason that I like to do that, and I'll backtrack a little bit with one of the, the pros of RP training, is it's giving you an accurate picture of where Luke is, Luke's training capability is at today. Okay. And one of the main issues with percentage-based training is it's always a concrete number. So if I said, give me five reps at 85% of your one rep max, that is a concrete finite number um, for that day. But what we're not factoring in is the stress that maybe Luke went through uh, that day, or maybe lack of stress. Maybe his 85% could technically be 90% because he is gotten great sleep, he's recovered really well, he's ate a lot of food, and he can push harder. So therefore, we're technically not going to the right stress stimulus needed for him to get the adaptation. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far of, of why it's kind of a pro and a con there? Uh, and when we can put both of them together, we get the best of both worlds, where we get the accurate stimulus of where he's at today. And then we can uh, use a percent of that number for the day and, and really hone in on the proper dose of stress that I want him to accumulate for an adaptation, right? Um, so kind of just real quick, um, we can go over pros and cons, or if anybody wants to ask, or Luke, you want to ask the direction of where you want this to go, I'm more than happy. I'm a very relaxed, chill guy, uh, so I'm here to answer all your guys' questions, make this a really good back and forth conversation. Of, of my thoughts on RPE, why I use it, when to use it. Uh, maybe if you guys have questions or Luke have questions, we can start just diving into things and uh, I'll just start shooting away. Hey, Joey, that's um, yeah, that's awesome. And I've just invited anybody who has any questions about anything to do with strength training, take this opportunity whilst we've got, whilst we've got Joey on. But here's, here's what I'm going to fire at you straight away, Joey, because uh, I, I've got a grasp of, of, of the evidence base here as well and i i know that you run a gym over there um called the lion's den yeah yes yes and you must have because we've got we've got a mix of people in here from clinicians to healthcare professionals to strength and conditioning coaches to yoga teachers and everybody's on this different different part of their journey into i'm hoping some people are going to be interested in maybe tweaking it some people are going to take from this and i hope that they're going to be interested to dive in and start how far into working with somebody that comes in through Lion's Den are you thinking about exposing them to this level of detail for programming, RPE, reps in reserve, as opposed to just do three sets of 10? Yeah, great question. And my answer actually has changed over time. So before I thought it was nice to have a base of percentage-based training because it was a concrete and a finite number. Um, so I used to say, you know, after you've run some templates where you're using percent based training, you know, and you're kind of heading into that intermediate phase of lifting. So I just kind of gauge someone who's lifting for maybe two years or so uh, with like structure and programming. Uh, and they soaked up all their quote unquote newbie gains or the novel stimulus of training. It should be a good time for you to start incorporating RPE. Now, my answer has changed in that fact because I get people integrated into it as soon as possible now. So if you were to come to the lion's den, we have open gym and group class-based uh, uh, workouts here. And it's a structured strength program in the classes that's anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks. And we use RPE for that uh, programming right away. And 
the reason I like to expose it to them is just because it's one of those, those things that's almost like, why not? Like, why wouldn't you want to yeah. try integrating that into your knowledge bank? And it's just another tool that you can grab out of the toolbox. Um, and, it, and the thing with RP is it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, I, I specify with my clients that we just want to be in the right ballpark. And, and you'll know, and, and what I gauge with that is if you were overshooting or, or you're failing frequently, we're probably too high in the RPE. And if we're not really getting a stimulus or we feel like there's always more in the tank, uh, we're probably undershooting. And it sounds simple, but when you practice it, it, it actually makes a lot of sense because you're getting the feedback from your body uh, pretty quickly. Like you'll, you'll know uh, and you'll, you'll be able to track your fatigue levels. Like if you're training for a month, and you're like, I feel great. I have like no fatigue, no stress. Well, chances are we probably weren't pushing as hard as we can. And we can make those adjustments for the next mesocycle. Uh, the other thing I like to ask with the clients that I work with is it's, even when they are doing percentage-based training, say someone comes in with me and they want to do a form check or they want me to just give them a, a review on their lifts based on their program and it's percent. Uh, so say they had to do five sets of five, at 75%. Well, I just like to ask them the question, playing devil's advocate, well, how many more do you think you could have done? You know, and just kind of get to get that in their head to start asking himself these questions. Um, and then they can have the percent there as a concrete number, but then also see how much they have left in the tank. Do those numbers match up to the, the fatigue that we're looking for, or if not, right? So if it's not enough of a stimulus, then I may say, well, you seem pretty recovered, okay? 75% for today probably should be more like an 80, right? So I like to typically program in a range or a window when I do percent-based training because it's like if we have the green light to push and it's there, why not take advantage of that, right? And at the same time, if it's not there, well, then maybe we can dial it back a little bit. Uh, or if they're starting to get systemic fatigue that's building up over time, we can pull back on that throttle uh, let the body recover a little bit and then have uh, long-term success rather than constantly hitting walls. And typically that's what I see one or the other. It's, you wish it was right in the middle all the time. And it's, it's usually that way when I work with the athletes, hence why I'm a coach. Um, but for people that come to me, they are either hitting the wall too frequently in terms of systemic fatigue, just beating themselves into the ground um, or they're not getting results. Um, they've been training for a long time and that's because they are not pushing hard enough. So that's kind of the bridge bridge there, but I would say kind of backtracking to your question is the sooner the better, it's just gonna be another tool that you guys have access and ability to, and you can utilize both of them for their pros and their cons. And kind of what I was saying before is you'll find that there's an intermixing of them, uh, which can deliver the best results uh, but just for you guys, basic practices, just ask yourself that question. You know, how many reps could I have done? What's the what's the purpose and point of the mesocycle, aka the block of training that I'm running? And is it following suit um, with that block? You know, so if we look at, at Luke's programming, um, so, so you're doing a great job of just pulling these things up, right? As I'm I'm speaking of them, I love it. Um, I, get a, I, 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 have, I have like a sense for yeah, yeah, just yeah. doing the it's, right it's thing. It's like you and I know what we're, <laughs> what, what we're doing here. Um, but he is working up to a one rep max of his deadlift and his log clean and press. So for the last two mesocycles, I've been having him work up to a single at a high weight, not a true PR. But what it's doing is it's giving us feedback on how his one rep max is trending. And if you were to look at that trend, it, it may go up, it may go down a little bit, but it may keep spiking up. And then we have an average. So for somebody who's testing a one rep max, it's like no surprise to how his training is going, right? Uh, and this is an RPE calculator. Like one of the things I would suggest to you guys is, I think it's a very simple website. I think it's just rpecalculator.com. Um, you'll be able to just type in your reps and your sets based on your RPE, and it will give you automatic feedback on your your average uh one rep max or even you know uh four reps out of ten what what would that look like or four reps at an eight right and and we do see 0.5s so 0.5s are great because you may be like 
Well, I probably could have done one to two. Well, then we're just gonna call that, you know, an 8.5, right? Or, or just kind of figure out the number in between there. And that's fine because once again, um, we're just looking to be in the right ballpark. And I think, I think a lot of people overthink RPE training where it has to be, they need to, they need it to be an eight. And it's like, even from someone who's been training it for five years, pretty proficiently, I'm confident that we're in the ballpark of an eight. Do I know if it's a true eight or not? No. Do I know if it's a 10? Yes, because I probably fail, uh, but I don't want to continue to fail. But as long as I'm in that stress window of where I want the number to be and the block that we're working on that has a specific goal, um, then I know where I want the, that stress and load to be at, right? Uh, and that's how we plan year round. So if I'm looking at my program and I have 12 weeks, well, I can rate those blocks on the average RPE that I want those blocks to be. So that way it's like, I know my stress management ahead of time and I know where I need to be in that, that programming cycle. And if I'm going on par with that, or if I'm not, and that's how we can make adjustments right away. And a lot of people don't take the time to actually do that. Uh, and that's what has them run into issues where they don't have some sort of auto regulation uh, that can, you know, uh, mitigate those issues from arising fast and, and hence allows us to train longer, smarter, harder, uh, and, and get really good results for the long term. Joey, if I just, if I just add you, so this, this is a great point guys, because I, if the clinicians amongst us, like, this is, this is just, this should be hopefully interesting for, for, for ev every one of us across the board, load management, as I said, it's, it's front and center. If we can, if we can grasp load management, then all of the things that this asymmetries, all the wonky stuff, all the biomedical things, they just don't matter. And I don't, I find myself navigating all the chaos of practice to be able to not focus on the super, superfluous things and the extra stuff. Because if load management is, if I can dial that in with my clients, most things just settle down. And I've, being able to work with, I'm, I'm, I see a lot of guys at the moment who are who are strong. They love the gym and they and they're lifting a lot. You guys, your market or your your market's going to be slightly different. But being able to work with RPE, I mean, I mean Joey, I've just put in. This is what I did today. I did a, I did two eight two point five for one at eight, which puts my estimated one rep max at three oh six. So we're working on my estimated one rep one rep max as opposed to constantly trying to find my max, which is what a lot of the guys I see in the gym they're always at their max. And some of the things, a really simple thing that I'll put in place with them is just, well, I'm not, you can't for four, for four or five weeks go any closer than two reps from failure. Just something like that to be able to have that buffer because the really high intensity stuff is where we run into problems, where we run into injuries. And this is one of the big things that I think RPE-based training, uh, Joey, is, is a big shift for people when they first come across this idea of an estimated one rep max. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of to piggyback off that point, and this is something it took me a little bit to get used to, but it makes sense when I talk about it and when, and when you see it, is the question, and we, we've been talking about this or, or I've been working on this uh, for a project that Luke and I are working on, is how often do I max out, right? Like that's a question everybody asks. And it's like, well, if I should ma max out all the time, when do I max out? And as you can see with Luke's programming, we haven't maxed out yet, but we are just tracking the data and using those numbers as, as just markers uh, for us to see. So if his, if his numbers are consistently trending up, say it was even for sets of five, because not everybody in this chat maybe wants to max out, maybe they just wanna get stronger and they wanna feel better. Well, in that case, you may actually never have to max out. All you have to do is watch how your sets of five are trending over time, right? And yes, there'll be some bumps where they go down, they go up, that's normal, that's fatigue. But if I said over a year, you're gonna run sets of five reps, you know, and I've done this before because say I had a year to get ready for a competition, I did sets of five if, and it was a strength-based program for uh, three mesocycles, Right. And I added in low stress weeks when I needed them uh, to keep my fatigue and systemic fatigue low. But because my five rep increments over time kept gradually trending up, what, what do you suspect that would mean for my one rep max? Right. If I'm doing 
400 uh, or 200 kilos or, or whatever, 400, whatever pounds for sets of five when I started and I get done with 450 or 250 kilos for sets of five, you can automatically deduct that my strength has increased, right? Um, now, if we want to get more specific with that, when it comes to testing uh, one rep max uh, skill acquisition, that's why we have on Luke's program doing uh, about two mesocycles out working on singles, because I truly believe that that uh, to get strong and to do a single repetition is a skill in itself. So I want to make sure that him as a client, whoever I'm working with, is proficient in that skill. They get to know what it feels like to pull on heavy weight. Because um, how many people in here deadlift? Do we have a, a good amount of people who deadlift, right? Or, or they do anything heavy for one rep max, right? I always find it with a deadlift, especially when you have new clients. How many of you guys have, have had an athlete go for a one rep max and they go to pull on the bar? You know that they have the capability to do it, but then they give up, right? You see them pull, pull, and then they just stop. Reason being behind that is because they haven't practiced the skill of pulling heavy weight because there's been times where I've pulled on a bar and it's taken about three seconds before the, the bar actually breaks off the ground. So when we have clients or I have clients that are, are working towards that goal, just remember that lifting heavy is a skill that needs to be trained. So there's two philosophies. You could gradually um, deduce volume and intent or in increase intensity, right? Inversely over time. Um, but the issue with that that I find is that they don't have enough practice at single work. So that's why we have in Luke's program doing singles. So if you guys are coaches and you have somebody who's working towards a one rep max, I would say two or three mesocycles out, have them start doing one out of seven. I think that's what I started Luke at. We did one block where it was just one out of seven, which yeah. is nothing crazy. And then doing their volume work based off of that seven. So hopefully this is making more sense now because that stress is super specific on the seven that they pulled for that day. And then the percentage of that is is even more specific because it's coming off of that single right um so there's two different ways you can go about it i've just found that if it if it comes down to people who want to just get strong and they're not necessarily caring about a one rep max you can you can still stick with the same rep ranges for a long period of time and just watch how they're trending or if you want to practice the skill of a single I would always have them work up. So we have one at an eight. We take off 15% of that, that single at an eight. And then we have them doing four sets of three uh, because that gives us a very specific and proper number based on his fatigue for that day. And then I have nothing higher than an RP8 uh, so that I'm kind of holding him back from overreaching or, or fatiguing too much uh, if we wanted to get even more, more down the rabbit hole of that. And this is a little bit more complex um, but hopefully you guys are grasping how useful of a tool it can be and based on how he's doing for that day, how specific we can get stress and load management with it, um, which long-term is going to keep us training uh, just way more efficiently. And just, just to, to piggyback off that, of course, guys, Joey is one of the best strength coaches, and he won't say this, but I'll say one of the best strength coaches out there. So to try and understand his programming is really, again, one of the one of the one of the yardsticks I have for you know when I'm reaching and connecting with Samantha Manuel when I'm reaching and speaking out with people who I who I'm inspired by people who I'm interested in I'm really interested in their art the art of how they take an ev the evidence based information but then apply it and that's really something that I think if you are uh, if if you're with a coach or if and, and they think that they're above coaching you know Joey's got a coach. It is something that it is an always an ongoing process of learning. And this is this simple thing. What I was want to say this, you, it's not about trying to understand or be a programmer like Joey, but it's something that, again, you guys may be interested in exploring some of Joey's templates, for example, because he's got an app that you guys could ex explore through this or me and Joey are working on a project that we're bringing out next year to help people go from pain to understand an RPE based training, but just, Taking this idea here, Joey writing, nothing higher than RPE 8, so just accordingly. That I mean, that's just something that is so easily applicable for all of us to be able to help immediately take and try and help someone to be able to apply 
the concept of load management with a sore body part. And Joey, a question that I want to be able to ask you here that I think people will find interesting because we've got um, we've got a really diverse mix of people who are attracted to internship, people who are really interested in heavy lifting, like myself, people who are really interested in dance, movement therapy, martial arts. I know you're passionate about martial arts as well, Joey. How do you go about applying? That's all I, I know sort of the answer to this, but I, I want you to be able to, to sort of elaborate on it. This to not a deadlift, which is a very linear set, so, you know, movement. Can you can we apply this idea to lifting an atlas stone or to jujitsu training or how would you respond to that? Is this some a vehicle that is this a tool that can be explored beyond just linear movements? I believe it is. I think it takes some time to get used to it. Um, so don't get discouraged, guys, when you're practicing this. And I know I've, I've said this before already, but it does not have to be uh, perfect, okay? It does not have to be perfect. Um, but with that, we can just use the tools of intensity, right? And principles of intensity with low, medium, and high, okay? That's how I, I go about it. Because a lot of people ask me, you know, because I, I I'm a professional strongman and I do jujitsu, right? And let's just say... Strongman is my uh, my specific goal at the time, and jujitsu is kind of my hobby that I enjoy. And I don't want my jujitsu game to affect my strongman performance. So with that, I would err on using RPE in the sense of of just putting it into low and medium and high intensities, and programming that in throughout the week. So maybe on and there's no right or wrong way to do this it's personal preference say i wanted to front load my week with high intensity activities i could put on monday you know heavy lifting and a hard jujitsu roll right but then i have to know later in the week that that's probably going to be a low and medium intensity week for the for the rest of my jujitsu training and that could be like an rpe let's just say five to six or five to seven however you want to group that. Uh, and, and you'll know because the fatigue, the, the, the feedback is always going to be the fatigue. And you'll be able to customize that by, say you do martial arts for an hour. Okay, well, if you did martial arts for an hour that you thought was a medium or to low intensity and you trained hard, but you're pretty beat up by the end of the week, well, then we need to auto-regulate that. And we need to realize that maybe now, Instead of that being a medium, that's a high for the for the martial arts. So now I need to bump that down. So maybe that means I need to somehow decrease the intensity of my martial arts. Maybe that means not as much contact. Maybe that means picking different training partners. Maybe that means 30 minutes instead of 60 minutes. Okay. So there is a way to do it. And I think over time you become very intuitive with it. Um, in the beginning, it's going to take trial and error, but always use the feedback mechanism of, of the fatigue. Okay, you're so in, Joey, you're in the right place for trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my whole life has been trial and error. I'll put it that way. I'm, I'm a guy. I do. Man, I'm trying to do strongman. I'm trying to do jujitsu at a high level. I'm trying to do a bodybuilding show. Uh, so you're in the right place if you're trying to talk to a guy that's done a lot of trial and error. Trial uh, and lots of error. Yeah. Uh, and, and just figure out that threshold. You could also inversely relate that in the sense of the beginning of the week is going to be where I have my hard lifting. And then I, I do very light uh, work on my martial arts. And then maybe at the end of the week, I have an, an, a very light lifting session. And then I have a harder uh, jiu-jitsu or martial arts, whatever you guys practice session and just see how that works. So there's gonna take some plug and play with this. Um, exactly, so you have some give and take, but it can be done, okay? And and myself and the clients that I work with, it's 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 proven, you know, and even through Helms's papers that he writes, it's ev evidence-based on the fact that you can do that. Um, now, there's a couple things that I, 
use percentage-based training for, okay? And that may be kind of like a good way to segue that is when it comes to certain strongman events, I think it can be more advantageous to use a percent of either the athlete's one rep max or a percentage of what they're using in their competition weight. So say their weight is already prescribed and what they're doing in the comp, we may go off some percents of those things. Uh, because for example, that makes sense. It, it can be difficult at times if we have an event such as a sled drag to a sandbag carry medley and strongman to find an RP eight for that, right? Like, what does that actually mean? So for the advanced athletes, they know because they've done the plug and play thing where they know what an eight typically feels like for them and how that's going to affect them the rest of the week with their fatigue for newer athletes and clients that I have, that is when I use a percent range of a one rep max. Now the key word is a range there because I want them to have the ability to when they feel that they can push to push. And when they don't have that um, recovery or they don't have that energy to do so, I want them to also be able to train and still get the best out of that training session. So hopefully that makes sense. And, and I know this is, I'm throwing a lot at you guys there, um, but and I know we have different levels here, but I'm just giving you the outlook of how it goes through my mind and also the different variables that you can play with when it comes to RPE based training and percent. Um, and like I said, how they're, they're mesh mesh related uh, and can be very beneficial when put together. Uh, but I, I do have a bias of RPE in the sense that I still think it's, it reigns supreme for the longevity uh, of, of training and fatigue management standpoint overall. Jerry, I just want to just just jump in there, but something that I find interesting is a lot of the guys that I train with in the gym, they're doing strong man, they're doing, and in their program, their coach has wrote for them today. Today you're lifting 250 for sets of five, and some days the co the, the, the guys are like, that's just so underdosed that it's like holding them back. Other days they're maxing them out. And something when you're writing programming for me, you're not having to, you're not having to guess where I'm at. You put responsibility in me by writing for me to find where I'm at relative to failure. So I find the way I communicate this, Joey, from what I see in the strength and conditioning and the personal training world, I see this as sort of the the same, the version of active self-management that I talk about in the clinical world of trying to get a client involved in being an active part of their program rather than just a passive recipient because in finding out my me being in charge i have to be involved i have to learn auto regulation for me to be able to apply your programming so that's something that i wanted to be able to put in and we've got some good questions coming in now joe i'm going to segue towards those um because one of them is about is there any changes here in or considerations towards working with people over the age of 50 and just before you answer that um you are the year-round strength and conditioning coach for the lacrosse team over there aren't you and so you're working with what is there and do you apply these in in the high school these ideas in the high school level so maybe just sort of dive into is it how do you apply this with people who with the guys who are young next generation versus those over 50 any difference yeah, so uh, so just as Luke had said, so I coach, uh, I'm an assistant head coach at a lacrosse team, so I actually coach them in the sport of lacrosse, and I do all their strength conditioning program. Uh, I also coach a college lacrosse team, and then I have another high school that I use, and we've used RP-based training for all of those guys. Um, I wanted to get them on board. Uh, this is, I've been doing this for a couple of years now with the lacrosse guys. Uh, but there has always been, and I call it uh, a developmental block. So the first four to six weeks, and maybe you guys had this question, I didn't actually look through the questions yet on like a time frame. but after about four to six weeks, they have a really good idea uh, of where their numbers are and how to rate and perceive RPE. So if you guys are dealing with clients uh, and you have fairly, uh, good exposure to them, meaning like multiple times a week, uh, or if you oversee things once a week with their programming, you know, at least three days a week, 
I have found on average anecdotally about four to six is like that beginner period. And then after that, they're a lot more in tune uh, where things are at. And, and to me, that was a lot faster than I thought. You know, I, I actually grasped it in that time frame, but it was kind of eye opening to see that the kids were able to grasp it that quickly as well. Um, so not that to say that is physical education. I wish I went to school there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to say that some somebody may take six to eight weeks, right? We, we have all different people that we work with. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're working with somebody for a long period of time, that's, that's a small fraction for them to really get on board with the RP-based training. Now, at the same time, I do run a gym. I work with uh, kids all the way to my grandma. I train my grandma. So my grandma's in her 70s, and she is doing all the compound lifts, which is awesome. She's kicking ass, and you know, or we're keeping her physically in, in shape, uh, and she uses RP as well. So... That's one of the reasons that I've really enjoyed it is because across the board, it's, it's, it's great for all ages. Um, I don't really change much uh, based on how I program for someone who's, you know, an athlete. Obviously, <laughs> I'll, I'll rephrase that. Movements are different, but in terms of the grand uh, structure of RPE, I still use RPE for my grandma who trains and as well as the lacrosse kids. Um, and and that's a whole different discussion because we're looking at how I, I program for the elderly through evidence and based on the clients that I work with, typically they have a slightly higher frequency uh, for like somebody like my grandma, because I'm trying to, to keep her moving more. Um, and her, her frequency is typically going to be higher. Okay. So we have just found through the, the research and evidence that elderly people, not to say that they need to have crazy sessions every day, if that makes sense, but just to keep them moving more throughout the week has been better uh, evidently based for them to be as healthy as possible. Um, and, so of course, and of course, your, 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 your grandma, Joey, her perception of at 10 is, is perhaps, re it's relative, isn't it? So. It is yes, it is relative. And for example, I don't have my grandma maxing out a lot either, right? Um, where the kids have finite goals, where we have twelve weeks of training, and then we we test their one rep max. But one of the things that I find myself preaching to the kids a lot, and what I talked about earlier, is mm -hmm. since they're so hungry, right? They're young. They're they're they want to see the improvements instantaneously. I asked them, okay, how's your five rep been, right? Has your five rep increased over time? Has your three rep increased over time? Are you getting PRs elsewhere than in, in the one rep domain? And they're always like, yeah, yeah, I have, I have, I have. And then I say to them subsequently, what do you think that means for your one rep, right? And then they kind of have this, this confidence in themselves that they don't have to be PR hungry all the time or a PR hungry in the sense of a one rep max. So dealing with the general population, I find that the same as well. Uh, with people in the gym once we kind of transfer them over to noticing how they're trending uh, with other rep ranges it, it's it's very advantageous because then they don't necessarily want to pr all the time they just know and they can follow follow the the trend of the programming and know that long term they're going to get the results if they stick to the plan awesome joey the there's a question here from uh, from Sam, which is a great one that I see a lot in people who are extremely busy, people who have family members, kids' responsibilities, they run their own businesses. You know, if consistency is one of the biggest challenges to being able to get to the gym, is this still a concept worth trying to apply? I've got my own thoughts on that. What would you say? They just shouldn't train. We all know that's the answer, right? They should just stop training. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, so <laughs> uh, so with that, it always comes down to what are their goals, okay? How much time do they have? And how can we get the best bang for our buck with that training? So if I have somebody who can train six days a week, that gives me a lot more play than somebody who, who can only train three days a week. And dependent on their goals, I need to strategically place some movements in there that will give me the best bang for my buck. And typically, that's going to be the compound lifts for the systemic uh, stress and load we can put on them to deliver the adaptation. But also, 
don't forget this is i don't know if this is my thing or if someone else said this but i always say compliance is the science okay so as a uh training professional we also need to fit in the things that are going to keep them compliant to train so if i'm telling somebody to do deadlifts and they hate deadlifts they're miserable doing deadlifts that's probably going to turn them off from training right that was so, me i hated deadlifts but joey just literally forced me to do a one rep max deadlift competition <laughs> and look at you now though look at you now <laughs> 306 baby no uh, no it's a, it's a great point because exercise adherence our internship's been so much about that that's why when, as you jumped in there joey you saw the guys playing with balls etc trying to make movement and exercise sexy some of the guys in here you'd be you know the skill set of some of the guys who are in here circus performers capoeistas is you know it's it's a big thing to be able to try and make exercise something some people are going to engage and stay with right right exactly and that's what it comes down to so um i'd rather have someone train three days a week for 30 minutes i guess is my point doing stuff that they enjoy coupled up with what i think can give them the best benefit for the time frame uh then feeling overwhelmed by what's programmed or not liking what's programmed and then turning them off from training and as a coach you know i've dealt with it with with luke right luke can't squat right now he's not squatting and kind of goes back to the point of we need to have a relationship right that's what this is all about and i'm not trying to get off topic here but as coaches you know luke and i talk pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis Okay, he gives me updates on what he's doing, what he's feeling. And my job is then to uh, adapt to what he's going through in what I feel like is the best way possible. So right now, since we don't care about uh, really hypothetically, he's not testing for a squat. Uh, I find that he's going to get more bang for his buck and doing as much pulling as he can during these last several weeks that we just cut out squats. Right. It wouldn't be advantageous for me to continue to push him on the squat when he is in so much pain. And nor do I find the benefits of squatting would even help. Now, that could be different if I had a power lifter who needed to squat bench and deadlift. I would probably still have some sort of squatting in there or, or squat movement pattern um, that they are able to handle a, a, a certain load at to still oh, keep that movement, movement pattern ingrained. Or even uh, isometrics or just some plan. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, isometrics or some sort of uh, like terminal knee extensions, like anything or Spanish squats, whatever. We would figure out something that they could do to still ingrain that movement pattern uh, because it's a skill that they're ultimately testing. But that's just to show you kind of, once again, how my mind operates in certain situations. And hopefully you guys can take something away from that when you're working with your clients, your athletes. But just to reiterate the point, compliance is the science, right? If you want to be a good coach and you want to keep your job and keep working with the client, you got to make sure that their goals are what matters to them and to you as well. I've seen too many coaches who put their, their goals before the athletes. And that to me is what can cost that relationship and to the client's uh, potential to succeed. It's uh, in, in the clinical in the clinical world, it's what we would call, and you guys are all on the same level now at week 10, patient, the patient-centered approach um, and going into the performance realm, the athlete-centered approach. And that's, I think that, that, delves, that lends itself to, to Matteo. Matteo is, is one, of, one of my chaps from, from previous internship. Um, I don't think he's able to jump on, but he's a strength and conditioning coach in Italy. Uh, and he works with professional basketball teams there. Um, his question here, Joey, is um, based on your experience with athletes when teaching R based on your experience with athletes when teaching RPE to athletes and coaches, how do you go about that? How long does it take to teach it and how do you clinically reason it to them? How can you make sure your athletes do not overshoot every time and become fatigued too much for their games of practice? So I guess what he's talking about there, Joey, is He's working with the multidisciplinary sports med setup, and they would have their, you know, I've worked and I've done stuff with a lot of professional teams and doctors. People tend to want to stay in their own categories. Strength conditioning is here, the physio is here, and there's can often be a lot of not, not a great cross talk. How how does how does Matteo or how do you go about being able to maybe communicate this with other professionals in a setup like that? 
So I think it's all holistic in a sense, right? Where if we can control fatigue management, typically we don't see a lot of issues arise or we get a red flag or a yellow flag um, when something could potentially head into that pain injury type setting. And that's where us as coaches with our relationship with the athletes um, are able to mitigate that through stress management. So one thing I do with athletes, and you may find this is beneficial, is I get a survey when I go in there, right? I, it's very simple. I just go, hey, guys, how are we feeling today, right? <laughs> and you'd be surprised. You either get, we're feeling awesome, we're ready to rock and roll, or you get, let's show a hands. How many of you guys can pull a triple at RP9 today? Half the room goes up. The other half right? Then goes, I say, okay, well, guess what we're going to do? We're going to do three sets of three at RPE five to six today, right? So then I can automatically auto-regulate that training session um, based on the feedback that I'm getting with the athletes. So that's how I handle it when I work with bigger groups and the athletes. So like we just did that the other day, we were leading up to a testing block. The intensity was high. I could tell some of the kids were banged up. So on the fly, I have two, two, uh, sets of what I want to do when I go in there. Okay. If the guys that can push, we're going to push three, three reps at RP nine. They're going to stick with that. The other guys, three sets of three RP five to six. So it gives them a little bit of a, a lower intensity, almost like a, a mock low stress week. And then they can continue on with the training when it comes to the accessory work. Maybe it's going to be some, uh, like we talked about some terminal knee extensions with a band instead, or maybe it's going to be some isometric holds. Those that can push, okay, we're going to do barbell RDLs. We're going to do some lunges or Bulgarian split squats. Uh, and that allows us to continue to train while allowing some of the kids to recover and auto-regulate that program right on the fly. And I think, I think for me, that's, that's a strong suit that I have personally is being able to read the crowd. And the more you do this, you'll be able to, to do that on the fly on your own. Uh, but it's a very simple strategy that I've implemented. And I talk about with my coaches as well, uh, because that's where the programming on the fly needs to change. If we're, if we're working with people who are on a 12 week block in, in the gym and they aren't ready to max, well, what's another week that we, that we just dial it down for a little bit, let the body systemically recover while also getting work in, because that's, that's a big one too. We could talk about that, right? It's like, a lot of people just take a week off or they do a deload where the intensity is super low and the volume is low versus a low stress week is what I call it. A low stress week still allows you to work sometimes even at high intensities, but reducing volume. So there's a difference between them and that allows them to recover while still training the skill at which we need for the sport. Um, so I'll leave you guys with that thought. But then the last thing is just explaining to the client, the students, uh, the, the trainers that if we can systematically run this program correctly, we avoid a lot of the issues where they need to go to the trainer or they need to go see a chiropractor uh, because we can handle that I've within the, the training. Said, if, people, if people do this stuff, Joe, I literally so many of the things that end up coming to me just literally get settled and sorted out without me having to actually do any of the typical physio or rehabilitation stuff. It's, it's, it's so, so, so yeah. interesting. Uh, Giovanni, uh, do you want to jump, jump on the mic? And uh, Giovanni, Joey is uh, one of my guys. He's in Italy. True. He was my training partner last year with some of the stuff that you were doing. Gio, yeah. jump on. Yeah. Hi, Joey. Nice to meet you, man. So uh, my, I'll, I'll, um, Piggy bag, that's how you say, right? On um, what Luke was saying, but and also what you said before, the fact that uh, taking Luke's example of knee pain, you're working around his knee pain, managing the RPE and managing the basically exercise, which is not provocative. Um, and and the the point is like, since I've started using RPE, which was training with Luke basically through your program, pretty much, I've learned a lot uh, about RPE myself. And I've started to implement a lot of the RPE work with my clients. So I'm a chiropractor and I, I do very little hands-on. I work a lot in the gym with my patients. And um, 
pretty much the rehab I'm doing, it's just what you mentioned. So I was wondering if, but you, you, you basically have answered in, in your last sentence. I was wondering how many times do you find need to actually send one of your clients or your athletes to have a rehab session uh, when pretty much is all about load management and working around the problem? Great yeah, question. so uh, it's a great question. And since I've implemented these strategies and something I'll continue to talk on, it's it's been uh, pretty few. Um, so typically when we have somebody who's injured, okay, I go also based on the, the biopsychosocial model, which you guys have probably heard of. Um, to death. Know, which is, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I'm not going to get too into that. You guys probably have that in your internship, but I'm a big believer in the biopsychosocial model. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with some other clinicians that are evidence-based and love, you know, pain management or pain science. Um, so for me, when it comes to the weight room, it's first thing is load, load management. Okay. So if they're squatting and they're squ when they get up to say, let's just say 200 kilos, 200 kilos causes them pain, but 150 kilos doesn't cause pain. Well, there's the answer. Let's go to 150 kilos. Let's do our sets and reps there. Maybe we'll add in a little bit more volume. Okay. Now, if we and we can take that all the way down to a bare barbell if we had to, because they're still squatting. So that's awesome. Now, if we can't do the squat, we go exercise variation. All right. So maybe they need to do uh, some sort of isometric, or maybe they need to do a tempo or an eccentric something like that where i'm forcing them with the variation to either work on shortening range of motion of the exercise that's the only time that i don't like full range of motion is when there's pain involved so let's just say they do box squats with no pain well we're still squatting and now we're just going to a box and they're pain free and we can shorten the range of motion to where pain happens well then that's what we're going to do the last thing i'll do is change the exercise completely so still working the same muscle groups. So hopefully it's making sense. So if we're, if we're trying to focus on a squat movement pattern, right? Quads, glutes, hamstrings, um, but they can't squat. Well, can they do uh, leg curls? Can they do RDLs? Can they do leg extensions? Like I'm a fan of, of that kind of stuff. If it allows them to train uh, around or within their threshold of pain that is, is not detrimental to making anything worse. Um, so that's kind of how I handle that on the fly. And I just make that checklist in my head, you know, load management, boom, exercise variation, boom. Do we have to change the movement? Boom. And we just go through that really quick. And typically what we'll find 98% of the time is over time, uh, their pain tends to go away. Um, so, you know, that's kind of been my philosophy. I've been living proof of that. My athletes have been proof of that. Um, I just had a client who, you know, really messed up his back, uh, couldn't do anything. And I just put him through a bunch of tests of let's focus on what we can do instead of what we can't do, reassuring them they're going to be okay. They're going to, there's nothing to panic or worry about. This is just, you know, our body giving us a red flag about something and then we need to just address it. And then putting them on a protocol for a couple of weeks, uh, using the same muscles and doing the exercise we can do and, and using the load that they're able to do. And within two weeks, this guy is back squatting, you know, a couple of plates on the bar. Yeah. So the proof's in the pudding there. Um, it's just being able to come up with the systems in your head. And, and I used to do that. I used to write it down like deadlift, right? How do we break down a deadlift, a squat, a bench, an overhead press? What are the exercises that use the same muscle groups? Um, if we had to change the exercise, what are the variations we can plug and play there? You know, and, uh, and, and over time, they, they've gotten better. Yeah, and I think, thank you for, for the great answer, by the way, because that, that's what I really love to do, basically. It's load managing and finding progression, progressions, variations, and even applying some of some Anton and Manuel stuff uh, into, into the rehab program some play. But I think, like, working this way it's also very motivating for the patient because if someone comes in with a back pain and it convinces their exploded disc or if they torn destroyed something 
and you have them there, as you say, they are thin maybe with a 100 kg squat, because I, I don't work much with that, but rather with general population. And they think the problem is hit the back and the squat, but they can squat body weight. It's liberating because it, it does show them that it's not about squat, it's about load management in that case. So it's also, you know, breaks down some beliefs someone might have and and i really think rpe and and i'm telling you this because it's a self-reflection that i have had over the year uh, doing training with luke and so i've kept on training with rpe based rpe based training is very liberating and motivating for the patient as well because most of the time you know this is better than me but they tend to underrate their strength and they stop much earlier so when you challenge them a little bit and ask them maybe to leave only three reps in the tank and they do maybe stop at 15 reps with 10 kg and then the next set you you ask them to complete those reps and they end up doing 20 more now they realize oh shit i, I do have some strength so it's it's very motivating and liberating for the fact that most of for example my general population clients who have never been in the gym they they have no idea like how hard should they train so today um for example i had a back pain patient uh, he has been terrorized by orthopedists and and, and um and other physios and chiropractors um but he, he went on to paris walked thirty thousand steps so never walked so much and and this happened last week and now his legs and calves are, are sore and we are at the end of the program, so around week 10 out of 12. And so he was like, what should I do? And I asked, I reversed the question asking, what would you think? So he was like, well, I should work maybe at RP6 on maybe squats or split squats that were in the program. And that was a big victory for me because I could see they, they were starting to, to realize that. So I really think RP is an art, as you described it. So, so far and um it's it's a great way to implement is maybe you answered this before but sometimes i do ask this myself too like should we try to expose our clients who have never been in the gym to an rpe based training or should we wait a bit till they take confidence because some i get you know might be too confused about the numbers about you know everything so what, what's your approach with that person that has never been in the gym yeah so real quick i took a couple quick notes because there was like three things i wanted to say when you were talking about that um the, the first one is it's okay to train hard you know i don't want people to to forget about that right mm -hmm. that when you are pushing hard and you're in the weeds of a hard training program reassure them like that what they're feeling is correct okay like you should you should be feeling a bit uh fatigued you should be feeling banged up because if we're not then we're not actually following the course that we we should be on right because if we don't push hard enough we're not going to get the adaptation which is the strength when we let the body recover so as inverse as it works it also works on the other side of like yes like you're going to train hard. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And, and, but we have to know when we're training hard and we have to reassure them that what they're feeling is also okay. But as a coach and the athlete, you need to know when is that not okay, right? Like when is systemic fatigue built too high? Um, but that's just one thing I, 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 I think as often as people train too hard, I think there's a lot of people who don't train hard enough. So mm -hmm. making it normalize that training hard is a good thing at the same time is another concept. The other thing I wanted to say real quick to what you said was um, it's very discouraging with percentage-based training, and that's why I like RPE so much, is the, the subjectiveness uh, and allowance to push when they can push and to backtrack when they need to backtrack. Um, because if we're supposed to come in and do our five sets of five at 80%, and it feels like dog crap, our joints hurt, our body hurts, 
they're mentally getting defeated that they they're not doing a good job or they're not pushing hard enough and that mentally can destroy them for subsequent training cycles so with rpe that doesn't necessarily happen because it's just rpe right it's not it's not like this concrete number that they need to hit so uh that's also why i like it now to get to your last point i just want because there's just some thoughts that i had like as you were talking about that is yeah, is sure is let them know how the block is supposed to feel, right? Like, hey, we're on a developmental block. This is just, this is getting you introduced to what we're doing. Okay, you should be building some fatigue. It shouldn't be in the first one to two weeks. If you're feeling like you're beat up in one to two weeks, something's wrong. When we're in an accumulation phase, where I'm pushing a lot of volume, you are going to be sore, okay? You are going to start gradually increasing systemic fatigue. You may get some tendinopathy. Like, but that is the indicator that we are pushing at the threshold that we need to, to push, right? If that makes sense. Um, so back to your, your primary question, I, and I hit upon this in the beginning, is that I tried to integrate RPE in there as soon as possible. Uh, and it can just be as simple as, even if they're doing percentage-based training, just ask them, you know, hey, how many more do you think you have in the tank? Because- no. Why not? Yeah, why not? Why not? And it can show them, um that maybe they can push harder right like if you're at 75 percent for a set of five and they're like i could have done 10 more well if we look at what 75 percent should be in terms of intensity or what the intensity you prescribe to the coach and we're not getting there well then they're wasting their time if they don't push more so um i just like to ask them those questions because like luke said why not like what is what is the con of introducing rpe like and it doesn't have to be at the level we're talking about it right now just give them some questions you know hey how did that feel like how many more reps could you have done uh what's what are we and you as a coach being like well this is where i want you did that feel accurate to where i wanted you for this training block and if they're like no it felt too light or it felt too heavy okay well then that then we just need to adjust and it's as simple as that yeah it's, um Great. Thanks for, for the questions, Joe. And I'm aware that it's quarter past the hour, Joey. So it's uh, Joey's a busy guy. He's got to get back. Some of you guys might be wondering at this point, well, fuck it. I don't need to bother becoming a physio. Become, just, just become a strength and conditioning coach. What's the point doing all, all the 10 years in university like I did? And my response to that question is when we look at the evidence base around a lot of the bleeding reasons for people having missed days off work, people having missed days off training, is persistent aches and pains. And as a healthcare professional, one of the biggest things that we're able to do is a really thorough assessment to rule out the things that are very unlikely, the 1%, which is very, which is our serious causes of aches and pains, fracture, infection, and being able to get towards reassuring, yeah, this back pain, it's not because of that really gnarly MRI scan that you maybe had or what the orthopedic surgeon has said to you in the past. As a healthcare professional, as a physio, as a chiropractor, we have bigger buy-in to telling people to, and this is just be an awareness of the information, the words that we use. People listen to me saying, drink more water than when I, before I was a chiropractor. That's just something that I think us being aware of. So whilst I put personal trainers, strength coaches, and, we're, and all of you guys are going to be somewhere in, in, in that remit as potentially the gold standard for delivering high value care all of these things we still have an enormously powerful role as clinicians to ensure that people are safe to be able to be grading um joey thanks so much for jumping in that was really engaging some of the guys are going to be watching this on recording i'll get a recording for you joey because you can have that on uh on on your lion's den app joey has um an app which i fully recommend if you're interested in applying all of these things loads of programs tailored towards whether you want to do bodybuilding whether you want to do bench press strength and conditioning but me and joey as he said before are building a project to be able to make that bridge from someone's in pain template to guide to the end goal being applying this to general as general gym-based strength and conditioning program which is going to be weaved into uh, the load and extension, which if any of you guys are going to be joining in January for that. So 
Thanks so much to everybody for joining in. I hope that you took loads from that. I mean, I'm, I'm, my brain is fizzing just his, listening to Joey talking about all of these things. Start applying these things now. The most simplest thing to take an action here is just whatever training you do, just at the end, just start asking yourself, how many more could I have done? Could have done three more. Okay, that's at seven. Just put that seven. And you just you start getting used to these ideas, start asking these questions. And then all of a sudden, we start developing the confidence to start manipulating intensity. Um, thanks so much, Joey and Sam. Uh, Joey, I'll speak to you on message. That was absolutely awesome. Thanks, buddy. Um, I don't think I've missed anything. I'll see you guys in uh, in the Mighty Network and see you next week for week 11, which is all about small business development, graphic design, all the stuff that it is to be around delivering this approach that probably doesn't get speaking about too much. So uh, thank you very much, guys, and I'll see you next week. Cheers, Joe. All right, Hello, hey, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank if you have you. any questions, uh, reach out, okay? I would love to, to connect with you guys, and I'm always here to help. So just shoot me a message on Instagram, email. Um, just before we go, I just wanted to say to everybody on here that your job matters to a huge degree. Uh, myself as a strength coach mixed in with you guys who are clinicians. We can all learn from each other, and we can bridge the gap, right? There's there's so many things that you guys can do and bring to the table. And I think that we can all learn from each other. So if you can take uh, the importance of some of the strength conditioning uh, principles and get your patients or clients uh, on board with that on, on top of everything else you do, it's just going to make you more valuable and more of an asset to your community and the people that you serve. Um, so, you know, I, I'm very grateful to be here on this conversation. I hope you guys learned some things about RP based training. Feel free to go and research it, ask me more questions, or check out some programs that are PE-based training, uh, and just compare and contrast, right? What did you like? What didn't you like? Throw it into your melting pot and tools that you have in your toolbox, and continue to serve those because there, there's such a huge market for it, uh, and you guys are doing great work. So uh, thank you again, guys, for having me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll pop all, oh. Joey's, I'll pop all Joey's details in the Mighty Network afterwards. Um, thank you very much, Joey. Cheers, Sam. And I'll see you guys next week. So thanks for taking the time for you guys who want to watch that video. Like I said, it's more educational based, but I think you can take some key points and principles away from it and also include that in your training for yourself or the clients that you work with. But once again, I just want to say thanks, Luke, for having me on. And until then, guys, stay a lean, mean, strength machine. Peace.